Welcome class to Advanced Aircraft Systems. I'm your instructor, Tom Mahoney. Today, we're going to cover lecture number three, which will be dealing with pneumatics, uh, aircraft pneumatic systems. And I'll uh, go ahead and get started. There we go. And we're off to the races. So we're going to cover pneumatics uh, as it relates to the CRJ-700. If you can understand the CRJ-700 pneumatic systems, you'll probably have a pretty good grasp on uh, most of the pneumatic systems that are used on other commercial uh, jets around the country. So here we go. Uh, pneumatic system uh, uses bleed air for multiple aircraft systems, as we've talked about. Bleed air comes from a... Uh, source of uh, jet engine uh, bleed air power coming from compressors, and we will siphon off some of that bleed air to run other systems on the aircraft. Bleed air is used for engine starting, engine cowling, cal anti-icing, wing anti-icing, and air conditioning and pressurization. So let's just take a real quick look here at what we've got going on. And... Uh, We'll zoom in here just a little bit. This is a sort of typical uh, pneumatic system showing on the left hand side of the aircraft. We have the left engine showing and we have some ducting showing in the schematic. I don't necessarily like this schematic except for one thing. It shows you the pre-cooler. I'm not sure about the rest of the stuff being actually accurate in terms of, in terms of the uh, CRJ-700. Uh, but we'll give it a shot and see how much sense we can make of it. So as you know, we use uh, the bleed air comes off of the compressor section of the aircraft engine, as we've talked about earlier. We can have uh, that bleed air siphoned off at the mid stages of the compressor, at the more aft stages. The difference is one is low and one is high pressure air or higher pressure air. In both cases, it's gonna be hot air. So because it's hot air, we need to do something to cool that down. So let's just say, for example, uh, we were siphoning off air at the low pressure uh, stages of the compressor. That hot air would come across, go through a check rip valve, continue on into the main uh, cross ducting of the pneumatic system. On its way do, to doing that, we would siphon off some air from the bypass air that we talked about the engine uh, getting developing. That's where it developed most of its thrust. But we're going to say that uh, we're going to siphon some uh, bleed air off, or not bleed air, but uh, bypass air off. That's going to be cold air. It's going to come around like this and pass through a pre cooler which is nothing more than a heat exchanger. So what's gonna happen is the hot air from, hot bleed air travels across the pre-cooler, the fan air or the bypass air comes around and helps pre-cool that bleed air so that the bleed air uh, is more manageable in terms of temperature to handle as it uh, goes down the uh, cross, uh, cross ducting in the aircraft. So that's what I want you to understand about a pre-cooler. The rest of this stuff on this uh, schematic, I'm not too impressed with, except that know what that pre-cooler does. So moving on to the next slide, we get to talk about uh, how do we control uh, the bleed air throughout the system? Well. On today's modern aircraft, they're always using computers to do this. Back when I was a flight engineer on the 727, we did all this manually. We would literally, the flight engineer was the computer. Uh, he would decide what uh, switches to flip, stuff like that, how we're gonna make the uh, system work the way it's designed to work. And you had to go through quite a bit of uh, training to be able to get uh, through that course and get on the line, actually operating your uh, as a flight engineer. Today, not so difficult because we have these computers that if the switches are put in automatic mode, uh, 
the computer will handle a great deal of the task loading that was otherwise required. Now, now the pilots just can fly the airplane. The system kind of takes care of itself. So let me just brief read this uh, for a second. So you have an air conditioning system controller on this aircraft. We call it the ACSC. We are uh, learning more, as we are learning, most modern jet aircraft systems are controlled automatically by a system computer. When the pneumatic system is in auto, uh, we place the switches in the auto mode, the ACSC computers automatically configure the valves in the pneumatic system for proper operation, depending on what's being demanded by the pilots or the system requirements. So let's just take a real quick look at the valves. Uh, you're gonna learn real quick what this valve is. It's called the isolation valve. Basically splits the system into half, left and right. And uh, you have valves coming from different locations allowing bleed air into the system. We have a start valve here. We've got the APU bleed air valve. We've got the anti-ice uh, for valve for the wings, the anti-ice valve for the cowl for uh, engine cowling. So those are some of the uh, things that the uh, air system controllers uh, operate automatically. In certain cases, the pods can operate them manually. Now, of course, in this slide, uh, we get more of a general view of what's going on here, uh, but let's just briefly read. Uh, pneumatic air is supplied by the engines or the APU or an external high pressure ground air source. Bleed air from the engines is what we're going to talk, talk about on this uh, slide. Compressed air from the engine is supplied from the low pressure and high pressure stages of the into compressor. The high pressure, pressure stages make up uh, air uh, when the low pressure stage is unable to provide a sufficient supply of pneumatic air and that's based all on the demand within the system. As additional pneumatic pressure is required, the high pressure valve is commanded to open by the associated ACSC computer, and that's how we keep the adequate amount of pressure in the system. So let's take a little closer look here of that system. I'm gonna come over here and highlight the, uh, zoom in on the left side of the aircraft. I'll tell you what, uh, before we do that, let's back up just a second. And I want to show you how this system is divided. Uh, on this aircraft, it's basically a left, right hand side system. You have the left hand side over here. You have the right hand side over here. And the left and right are divided as a result of the isolation valve being closed. That isolation valve uh, is normally in the closed position when you're at uh, flight altitudes, there's no reason to have uh, one engine running both systems or vice versa. Uh, so normally, uh, you've got a left and a right system uh, isolated from each other by the isolation valve. That should make sense. They call it the isolation valve for that very reason. So let's take a look at just the left-hand side. The right-hand side is pretty much a duplicate of the left-hand side in terms of the way it operates. So let's uh, zoom on in, take a closer look at what we're dealing with. Okay, so here we're looking at the left-hand side. There's our isolation valve. And what we have over here is the compressor, let me just kind of draw that in as if it were in the center of the aircraft. So here's your compressor. Pretend that that's in the middle of the engine somewhere in the core, obviously. Uh, you will be taking bleed air off of the low bleed air six stage portion of the compressor. For high stage air, we're getting it from the 10th stage. So we have the six stage, providing low pressure and the uh, sixth stage providing low pressure and the 10th stage providing high pressure. When the uh, sixth stage is unable to provide an adequate amount of pressure in the ducting, 
then the uh, computers will tell the high pressure valve to open right here, and it will modulate open to the point that it provides sufficient additional sufficient pressure into the system from the 10th stage portion of the compressor. So that modulates open only when needed. Otherwise, it's normally working on low bleed air pressure from the sixth stage of the uh, N1 compressor. As the uh, pressure comes across the ductwork, it would stop as it gets to the isolation valve and it can be redirected, for example, to the engine, uh, the Cal anti-ice valve, where if you wanted anti-ice, you would open that valve and then we could come up here and provide hot air to the leading edge of the engine cowling uh, to keep it from icing up. We also have the same situation uh, where we have anti-ice up here uh, and it operates virtually the same as the uh, Cal anti-ice valve. Aside from that, the big difference between the left side and the right side is what do we all have on the left side that's not on the right side? So let's take a look here. We have external air source and an APU, which is on the, is uh, left to the isolation valve. So we'll talk about that here on the next slide, but this is basically what we're doing. We're siphoning off bleed air to run the left side with the left engine and backing out of this, we have, uh, let's get rid of our scratches. We have the right side uh, supporting the right side pneumatic system. So left and right, that's how that operates. Uh, the only difference, like I say, between the left and the right side is where the APU and the external air ports are located that uh, they're on going to be left of the isolation valve. So now we're going to talk about the uh, bleed air from the APU. When the engines are not running, but instead the APU is operating, then bleed air can be used to pressurize the pneumatic system from the APU. Although normally used for starting main engines while on the ground, the APU bleed air can be used as high as 25,000 feet on the CRJ when the APU bleed air valve is open and the APU is operating. We would not use bleed air from the APU higher than 25,000 feet because obviously above that altitude, the air gets too thin and the APU can't develop the pressure that's required to operate the uh, pneumatic system. When the pneumatic isolation valve is closed, the APU only provides pressure to the left side of the uh, pneumatic system. As you can see, right here we have the isolation valve. APUs to the left side of that. Therefore, when the APU load control valve is open, it's only going to provide pressure to the left side of the system. When it's uh, open, it obviously then can provide uh, pressure to the right side of the system. So let's just take a little closer look at this. Uh, We'll come up here, close in on that, pull this down or pull it across. I guess that's as far as it'll go, doesn't matter. Um, so in this case, uh, what we're showing here is that the APU is running. It is providing bleed air, but the bleed air cannot travel any farther than the APU bleed valve. In some cases, this is called the load control valve. Uh, Regardless, on this aircraft, we're calling it the APU bleed air valve. As long as that valve is closed, we cannot use the APU to pressurize the pneumatic ducting uh, in the pneumatic system. So let's say we go ahead and open that valve. And as long as the valve is open and the, uh, the APU valve is open, 
and the isolation valve is closed, we will be able to provide pneumatic pressure from the APU to the left side of the pneumatic system. If we have the APU bleed valve open while the APU is running, and then have the isolation valve open, we can now provide pressurization to the entire system uh, without having to have the engines running. And therefore we can do a couple things. We can start either engine with APU air pressure, or we can run the packs, either pack with the APU system. We can anti-ice things, but no need if we're using the APU and the engines aren't running, there'd be no need to uh, anti-ice or de-ice the wings or the engine cowling. But uh, so in this configuration, it's kind of like we're getting ready to either start the engines or we're going to be running the air conditioning system using the left and right PEC, uh, which stands for pneumatic air conditioning kit. So that's kind of how it works. Now you notice down here, the switch says uh, isolation uh, open. That's what's opening this valve right here. So normally this switch would be in auto, but since it's in manual, that's what makes the isolation valve operate when we flip it open. Otherwise, it'll do things automatically. Now moving on to high uh, external high pressure ground air source. Uh, what we can say about that is that uh, it's used exclu exclusively for engine starting. We don't use this uh, high pressure source for powering up the packs or trying to de-ice. This is a ground-based uh, high pressure source. So used exclusively for uh, starting the uh, engines when there is no source of air from the APU. So let's say our APU happens to be inoperative. Uh, we get to an airport that we need to get the engines restarted. They would pull out a pressure cart and uh, provide us with some high pressure air. Um, the high pressure air provides air to the left side of the pneumatic system when the isolation valve is closed. It can provide air pressure to the right side when the isolation valve is open. On the CRJ700, it's important to note before using high pressure external air, both engine bleed valves must be manually closed to prevent the main engine bleed ductwork from being back pressured. And the APU pneumatic ducting has a one-way check valve to help prevent the APU from uh, being back pressured. So let's take a look at that. Again, we'll zoom in here. Well, we'll start down here for a second. Okay, so here we have a, a view of looks like a, a engine powered uh, pressure cart as well as a GPU, ground uh, power unit. So they're using both to get the engine started because apparently on this jet today, the APU is not operating. So we need to have an electrical source, which is our GPU. And then we're gonna have a pressure source, a uh, high pressure, external high pressure source coming from an engine driven pump, which would be uh, attached to the left side uh, rear of the fuselage. And that would duct pressure into the pneumatic uh, ductwork at this location. And since we have a check valve here, the air pressure can go only one way and it travels up and now is providing pressure to the duct. With the isolation valve closed, uh, the right side ducting is not pressurized. And because we have a check valve on the APU right in this area, we're not back pressuring the APU and allowing air to bleed out, okay? Now, uh, let's say we're going to start the engines. Note that the engine bleed valve is closed. That's a requirement. Also, it's closed over here. So to start this engine using external high pressure air, we're going to open the start valve. 
once we open the start valve, that will allow duct pressure to engage with the starter, which is mechanically geared to the into shaft. And then it will turn the into shaft, thus turning the compressor, the into compressor, and the into turbine. Once that action starts uh, taking place, air is, begins to be sucked through the engine. That air that is sucked through the front of the engine starts rotating the N1 fan. Since the N1 fan is attached by via a shaft to the uh, N1 turbine, they start to show some rotation. Once we get rotation on all the components in the engine, then we start adding fuel to the combustion chamber and at the same time ignition. The ignition lights off the fuel. We've created a bulkhead as we discussed, a pressure head behind the compressor and therefore the expanding gases flow rearward over the turbines and they keep the uh, fan and the compressor in one into compressor turning and the start uh, cycle is complete and continues as long as we provide fuel to the burner cam. So that's kind of what we're doing there with the high pressure external air source. We're starting an engine with uh, out having to use the APU bleed air. Now, let's say uh, we've run out of air once we've got the uh, number one engine started. Then we can start the number two engine by simply opening the isolation valve, allowing pressure to come across uh, to the right side pneumatic system. We can then open the start valve uh, on the number two engine using bleed air from the number one engine and the rotation of the starter motor would again uh, start this be, be the beginning of the start sequence for the number two engine and we then would start it in the same manner as we just started number one engine. So that's how that works. Pretty, pretty simple once you understand the basics. Um, I can tell you when I went to TWA, I had never flown a jet before, had a little bit of time in a, a King Air. And other than that, I had no idea what I was doing until I went through training as a flight engineer. So, we know that the bleed air is really hot, okay? So we have to have some way to monitor whether or not we have a leak in the system. This air is so hot that it can actually warp aluminum. Uh, we don't want it to warp the leading edges of our wing when we're putting anti-ice uh, to it. So we have to have some sort of monitoring system. Since bleed air comes from the compressor sections of either the main jet engines or from the APU, this air is very hot. To detect leaks in the pneumatic system, heat sensors are strategically located throughout the aircraft. Temperature sensors alert the pilots to take action to prevent aircraft damage. So scattered throughout there is strategically located some temperature sensors throughout the aircraft. They can be just about anywhere, maybe here, maybe there. Uh, so wherever they're located, they're measuring the temperature of the ductwork. Additionally, we have dual loop sensors that are also designed to run parallel to the pneumatic ducting. The dual loops provide alerts to the flight deck when two side-by-side -side loops detect an overheat in the same loop system at the same time. Now that's important to understand. The requirement for side-by-side -side loop to detect overheat at the same time helps prevent nuisance alerts. And therefore, uh, we can continue to use the system if only, if we're getting a nuisance alert uh, from one, we certainly wouldn't want to shut the uh, de-icing system down if we're in icing conditions. So they've designed it so that uh, on any one of the, these ducts, throughout the system. Let's go ahead and just zoom in. On this system, here we go. 
So for example, here, we'll just take a look at the uh, left leading edge wing. We have a dual loop system, not the yellow lines, but there's some light uh, blue lines in here. And uh, they cross through here and go both left and right sides. If there is a leak in the left wing duct, say where the little icon hand is, if just one of the loops detected a leak and the other one did not detect a leak, we could assume that we have a nuisance alert. So to avoid nuisance alerts, both loops side by side have to detect a leak in that area. And if it does, then we can assume that we're getting two indications of a leak, so therefore we must have a leak. In that case, we would wanna take action based on the QRH, whether or not to shut this wing anti-ice valve down and isolate this system. And if we were in icing conditions, for example, we would wanna vacate the area immediately. So that's why we have dual loops is so, we, so they give us a, a for sure indication that there is a leak. A single loop indicating that would be considered a nuisance alert. We don't wanna to have to have that. So here we are back again, looking at the general overall system. That's pretty much how it works. That pretty much completes uh, my lecture on pneumatics. I hope that gives you enough information that when you go into your AeroSim module and review the systems uh, in the module, you'll have a kind of an understanding so that that module just doesn't blow you away completely with over information. Uh, anyway, get into that module, review it, and don't forget to sync your progress in those module, modules so I can give you credit for it. And once again, once you're done with that module, get into Hangar Talk, develop a question uh, or surrounding the pneumatic system, ask the question, develop some fake answers, but always provide me with a good answer and the uh, location in the module where you pulled that answer from and we'll try to see if we can use that question on one of my tests. Get a few extra bonus points that way. In the meantime, love my job. Glad to be here. Hope I can make a difference.